Well, welcome everyone to the March general meeting of the Kalamazoo Astronomical Society. We currently have 98 people on Zoom and uh, five people on YouTube. And uh, so again, yeah, with uh, couples, we have uh, well over 100 people again. So I know some people don't enjoy the Zoom stuff, but uh, it's been going very well. We've been reaching a whole new audience and uh, hopefully getting members that uh, would otherwise not turn out. Feedback. But we still have not got people fully trained on how to um, act on Zoom or uh, control their systems on Zoom. So it's still a work in progress. By the time we perfect it, we'll be meeting back at CAMSI again. <laughs> so let's just uh, jump right into it. We're not going to waste any time. Tonight's guest speaker is chairman of the Mars Institute senior planetary scientist at the SETI Institute and director of the NASA Houghton Mars Project at the NASA Ames Research Center at Moffett Field, California. It must be tough doing your taxes every year with, with all those W-2s. He holds a ME in geology and geophysics from the University of Paris and a PhD in astronomy and space sciences from Cornell University. He was Joseph Viverka's last graduate student and Carl Sagan's last teaching assistant. I'm sure we're going to want to hear about that later. So without further ado, please welcome Dr. Pascal Lee. Hi, everybody. Hey, thank you so much for having me. Uh, and thank you, Richard, for, for inviting me. I really appreciate it. Uh, since you are all astronomers, uh, you are by definition my friends. And so I, I'm going to obviously skip through a lot of the introductory material in, in sort of my, my talk. Uh, with the assumption that you're all very familiar with all this. Um, so tonight I'm going to talk to you about something that is not necessarily the most popular view at the SETI Institute. Uh, SETI, of course, stands for Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, but it's an institute actually that just studies uh, anything that has to do with uh, uh, our odds, well, anything that has to do with life in the universe. So that's a very broad uh, scope. Uh, but I remember when I was hired at the SETI Institute, I, I gave a talk and, in a boardroom, and one of the attendees was Frank Drake of Drake Equation fame. And Frank Drake, at the end of my talk, leaned over to his assistant and said, okay, we're going to hire him under N sub E. And as it, as it turns out, scientists at the SETI Institute are hired to address different terms of the Drake Equation. Uh, so I'm going to talk about that equation tonight. And for those of you who are... <clears throat> Uh, math phobic, uh, no fear. Uh, it's a uh, it's mathematically actually a very uh, simple uh, equation. It's very elegant in that way, and uh, it's it's also not hard to to understand what it um, you know what what it what it tells us. So, uh, in any case, without further ado, I should probably just jump into my talk, and then we can we can save uh, the questions for for the end. Anyway, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, okay, so here's the talk. All right. Uh, do you see this? All right. And do you hear me well enough? Okay. So uh, the capital N is the number uh, of advanced civilizations in our galaxy. And, you know, most people will assume just because we are all in awe at the number of stars in the, in the heavens and of course in our own galaxy. And now that we are aware that most stars probably have planets or planetary bodies around them in a broader sense, uh, you know, this number N ought to be really large, uh, especially if civilizations and intelligence and beings like ourselves are, are the product of a sort of natural processes that could happen anywhere where, where chemical conditions are, are suitable. Uh, so, um, Therefore, it's it's somewhat surprising that anyone would, uh, you know, come up here and say, well, maybe N is not that large of a number, and we might actually be alone in the Milky Way, uh, in spite of uh, the the large number of stars in it. So, let me try to to make the case for this. And needless to say, there's no certainty behind this number. It's you know there are huge error bars behind this number, but. What the take home message, and I might as well just give it to you up front, is that uh, N is, as far as we can tell, based on the limited data we currently have, is more likely to be a small number than a large one. Okay. It doesn't exclude it being quite a bit larger than one, 
but uh, you you have to essentially ignore some data uh, in order to to uh, to sort of believe that. So let's let's start with this view. This is a deep field view, a Hubble Space Telescope deep field view of the of the cosmos, and pretty much everything except a couple of exceptions. Uh, everything that's a, sort of a source of light here in this frame is a galaxy. And so we, we live in a galaxy that has uh, approximately 100 billion galaxies. That's a one followed by 11 zeros. And then each galaxy might have, they become big and small, but each galaxy might have about 100 billion stars. So that's another one followed by 11 zeros. And then if you assume that essentially each star might have on average uh, a, approximately, let's say 10 planetary bodies, and they don't have to be large Jupiter-sized planets. We're, we're talking about things that might be as small as Ceres or Pluto, uh, you know, sort of the thousand kilometer class thing uh, to, to objects that are like Jupiter and Saturn. And so, you know, um, let, now that we're finding a lot of planets around other stars, uh, let's assume for a second here that we're talking about about 10 planets per, per star. Uh, well, then let's look at the numbers. Uh, the, the number of planets in our universe it's the, is therefore about 10 to the 11 times 10 to the 11 times 10. And that's a staggering number, 10 to the 23, which uh, amazingly is very close to what chemists know, chemists know as, the Avo, as Avogadro's number, okay, which is 6.07, 10 to the power 23. So if you're an astronomer, you know, you're not phased by anything that's off by about an order of magnitude. And so within an order of magnitude, the number of planets in the universe is about one mole. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, and, and then in terms of planets, if you, in terms of planets in our own galaxy, that would be 10 to the 11 times 10. That's about a trillion planets or planetary bodies in our galaxy alone. Okay. That's the ballpark. Now that's a staggering number, a trillion planets. Uh, and however, as, as big as this number is, it's not infinite. And as a matter of fact, it's uh, actually more than 23 times less than the national debt today in dollars, just to put things in perspective. So if you are staggered by the number of planets in our galaxy, then you should be in awe uh, about our national debt. Okay, so uh, this is sort of the popular vision of uh, the our chances of having civilizations out there within our galaxy, it's a it's a popular view that's repeated in in our popular culture on television, in film. You know, on the left you have a galactic bar or a place where where ambassadors from different planetary systems meet somewhere in the galaxy for for diplomatic uh, talks, and then on the right you have a scene from Star Wars. You know where you have a, a bar scene where where people from different corners of the galaxy come hang out, and you know try to get a gig, uh, or have a drink, and so, <clears throat> but you can see how in some sense, anthropocentric this perspective is. We're we're in some ways projecting our, you know, our own society uh, into the cosmos. Uh, this is sort of how we live. Uh, it's it's how we are. Uh, also accepting of diversity in our society. And uh, in some sense, we tend to view that if we accept the notion that there are many civilizations out there, then we are an open-minded person, okay? I mean, who, out, who right now would say, well, we're really alone out there, who's an astronomer, okay? Uh, and therefore, the, the, the sort of the, the view that one is inclined to subscribe to is, is the notion that somehow we're really far from being alone and that there are many civilizations out there. We just haven't heard from them yet. And, you know, maybe they're not interested in us. But, uh, you know, generally speaking, people are, are really open to this notion that we're not alone and we're, we're, we're just not involved with these peoples out there yet. But uh, somehow, someday, our day will come. Okay. But let's look at this uh, Drake equation. So Frank Drake, uh, in the early 60s, organized a workshop, uh, the first of its kind, and he wanted to try to find a scientific way 
through this workshop to determine what the number capital N is, the number of advanced civilizations in our galaxy. This was the early days of big time uh, radio astronomy. Uh, one of the ideas was to listen to the stars and the cosmos for a potentially extraterrestrial signal. What were the chances of us finding another alien civilization out there? And so this workshop was convened and uh, Frank realized that there were a number of factors that had to come into play that would determine what this number N would be. And in fact, the workshop was essentially organized uh, in different sessions, each session focusing on one of these sort of factors or, or considerations that one would have to take into account to understand N. And so there was a, a session on the rate of star formation, R sub star. And then there was a session on uh, how frequent, how what, what fraction of stars might have planets. Uh, is this a large number or a small number? And then there was a session uh, thinking out uh, what, uh, how many, what was the average number of environmentally suitable <clears throat> for life, planets that would be environmentally suitable for life in a planetary system. So this is the N sub E, average number of planets with environments suitable for life within these planetary systems. And the definition there of suitable for life, of course, is, is a bit uh, geocentric as well. It's, it's a planet where you have liquid water available for you know, substantial amounts of time. And that, of course, is a requirement for Earth life. But um, be that as it may, it, it was not an unreasonable assumption uh, you know, to, to sort of define N sub E that way for at least for now. And then times the, the fraction of those planets that are suitable for life where life actually emerges. So the thinking was that just because you have liquid water ocean doesn't mean that you'll necessarily have life in there. Something might have to happen uh, chemically or um, otherwise to, to allow life to actually appear. Uh, and then times the fraction of those planets with life where life actually becomes intelligent times the fraction of those planets where there is intelligent life, where this life becomes an advanced civilization. And by that, we mean a civilization that is capable of interstellar communication. Although it's, that's a very important subtlety to, to, to remember. It doesn't imply that you will necessarily want to communicate. Uh, it just means that you could. And for one thing, we don't really send a lot of signals out there, at least not on purpose. Uh, we, on the other hand, we're listening. So there could be more listeners than talkers, uh, but this is the, the idea that at least we can, and by definition, therefore, we are uh, so-called an advanced civilization. Times the final term, which is the average longevity of a civilization, okay, of an advanced civilization. So what is that number? Is it a million years? Is it a billion? Uh, is it, you know, is it forever? Uh, or is it actually a short time? Okay, so we'll, we'll see that. Anyway, Frank's uh, workshop was divided into these, these sessions, and then uh, it then dawned on everybody, but in Frank, to, to Frank uh, in particular, that the number N would be the multiplication of, of all of these factors. So mathematically, it's a very simple equation. It's the multiplication of seven factors, seven terms, we don't know the exact value, the exact, exact value of each one of these. So there's a lot of uncertainty around N. But if you knew the exact value of every one of these terms, then you would get N, the number of advanced civilizations in our galaxy right now. So I'm just summarizing this here. You don't have to read this. So there are optimistic views. Uh, if R sub star, or R star is 50, and you, you put all these F numbers at one. By the way, these F numbers, because they are a fraction, you know, F sub I, for example, is the fraction of planets that are environmentally suitable for life that actually have life appear on them. So it's, it's anywhere from zero to one, one being 100%, zero being 0%. So these F terms cannot be larger than one. On the other hand, they can be really small. And I call these F terms the killer terms because every one of these F terms at most can do nothing to M to N 
because you're just multiplying the whole the other terms by just one whereas it could really hurt n by being possibly close to zero okay so it's very important that if you want n to be a large number that none of these f sub something numbers f sub p f sub i f sub l f sub c be a small number okay so in an optimistic scenario we max them out they are at one and then n sub e is usually taken to be a relatively <clears throat> narrowly defined number there's one planet that is environmentally suitable for life in a planetary system and then the longevity of a civilization the thinking is that well let's give that a million years let's be a little optimistic and so in that scenario you have n equals 50 million in our galaxy which means that the nearest civilization is about 10 light years away okay so so that clearly uh, is going to come across to many of us i think even just intuitively as being overly optimistic we you know very few of us would expect to find an intelligent civilization just 10 light years out uh, but that's a, that is an optimistic uh, scenario. Now, the standard view, or more standard view, is that the rate of star formation is only 20. You, you still max out the other terms. Mind you, n sub e could be quite a bit more than one. Uh, it could be 10. It could be you know, 100 environments that are suitable for life in the planetary system. That's unlikely because it's an average number, right, n sub e. Uh, L, 5,000 years. And we'll justify that assumption a little bit later. Uh, in this scenario, you are dealing with n equals 10,000. This is sort of what the SETI Institute tends to assume, okay? About 10,000 civilizations in our galaxy. Uh, and therefore, the nearest one might be about 1,000 light years away. Although I should say that the SETI Institute is actually quite open to you know, variations from all this, including you know, radically different numbers. But the whole motivation for when you write a proposal to search for, uh, you know, um, a radio signal or techno signature from from you know stars in our galaxy, you you need to assume some optimistic number like this or some standardly optimistic number like this, uh, with with about ten thousand civilizations in our galaxy, okay, to 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 be to be found. So let me go through our talk today where I'm going to assume for a sign, I should say, I'm gonna to assign to each one of these variables with the Drake equation, a number that I will argue is, is, is conservative, uh, is reasonable, and to the extent possible is based on, based on data. And if the earth is the only example we know of, well then let's, let's look at what the earth tells us uh, in case the earth, earth's case was generalizable. Uh, but let's not assume something that is even radically different from what the Earth has experienced, because then we're, we're sort of in, you know, we're just in sci-fi land. So if N is a large number, where is everybody? Okay, and this is the Fermi paradox. Enrico Fermi won the Nobel Prize uh, in physics. Uh, he made many contributions to, to science. He uh, found neutrinos in particular, but anyway, um, uh, he posited this uh, paradox uh, where, indeed, if n is a large number, how come we, we don't see any evidence of, of these others? And so there are a number of possible explanations okay, for the Fermi paradox that have been put out over time. Uh, the, the explanation here is that n is indeed large, but it just appears small. Okay, and, the, and here are some of these interpretations and, and assumptions. Uh, interstellar communications and travel are just too difficult. And so the interpretation here is that there are many of them out there, alien civilization, intelligent civilization, but they, they're just not pursuing interstellar comms and, and travel. It's, it's just not worth it. Uh, intelligent civilizations are too alien. So they are talking to us, they are making themselves known, but we don't recognize their signature in the sky. Uh, it's sort of the lost in translation argument. Intelligent civilizations are too advanced or too busy. We mean nothing to them. They have other fish to fry. So this is the, you know, <laughs> we, we don't matter enough to be included in the galactic club argument. Uh, intelligent civilizations are not uh, radio loud for long enough, okay? They, you know, so, so this, of course, is an argument you might be familiar with. 
radio communications is sort of one way of communicating with uh, electromagnetic waves, but then it can maybe it becomes passe and you sort of need to transition to laser, optical laser or something radically different. Uh, and so since we're continuing to listen in the radio waves, uh, you know, maybe we're just, we're just missing the boat here. Uh, they've all switched to cable is sort of the argument. Uh, intelligent civilizations are avoiding us. And Carl Sagan used to say jokingly that that was the best proof there. There's intelligence out there. Okay. Uh, intelligent civilizations are breeding us. Okay. We are somewhat somebody's ant colony. We are just being, you know, we're, we're there for entertainment purposes. Uh, intelligent civilizations are protecting us. They, they follow the prime directive of Star Trek. In other words, they recognize that we are a young burgeoning civilization, possibly with some hope or some redemption ahead of us. And so might as well just let us thrive and don't interfere with us. Okay. Um, they might be around, mind you, but just cloaked and we, we're not aware of them. Intelligent civilizations are studying us. We're someone's science project. Okay. We are, well, they are training us. We're not worthy yet, but we're not potty trained. Uh, but one day we, we will mature and we will then be initiated to the galactic club. Uh, intelligent civilizations can't agree on what to do. Okay, in other words, should they talk to us? Should they not? They, they are faced with a conundrum. Uh, they have, uh, my joke here on this is that they have a Congress too. They can't make up their minds on what to do. Uh, intelligent civilizations are here, but unseen. Now, this is actually a common theme, of course, in science fiction. Uh, you know, we've already been invaded. They are in process of taking over. Uh, they're not, just not quite ready for prime time yet. So in that case, we're in a lot more trouble than we realize. Uh, another argument is that SETI, our SETI effort is young. We, we've just started. We haven't been able to listen or find them all yet or find anyone yet, but it's a matter of time. Uh, SETI is misguided. That's another argument. You know, we're not doing the search right. For whatever reason, they are out there, they are known, they are visible, they would be visible to us, but somehow we're missing them. And then finally, SETI is suppressing evidence. They've actually been found. We're not alone. SETI Institute in particular knows, uh, but uh, we're, not, we're not telling. And <laughs> right in fine print, this space intentionally left blank. Okay, so this just gives you a, a, a range of quote, explanations, how you explain away basically the Fermi paradox, the assumption being that N is large is just that so there's some other reason why it appears small. So uh, meanwhile, we seem to be really connected to the rest of our galaxy and the most visible way is actually from the recent visit of these two interstellar interlopers, uh, Umuamua and of course, um, uh, Comet uh, Borisov, uh, this is Oumuamua that came tumbling through the solar system uh, a couple years ago, uh, to, shown to scale on the left with uh, the USS Intrepid. Okay, so it had the perfect size for <laughs> an aircraft carrier. Okay, uh, and then I have a little cartoon here on the right uh, that I did where I say, okay, no intelligence in this system, everybody back to your hibernation quarters, engage warp drive. Uh, discreetly, I said discreetly. Okay, uh, and there are some speculation, of course, that that Oumuamua might actually not be a natural object. That you know, it um, it has some residual acceleration in its trajectory. That you know, some astronomers claim is not easy to explain or or is unexplainable. Uh, the the upshot of this whole argument is that uh, there. There is nothing so far that is compellingly making the case that Oumuamua is behaving like an artificial object. Uh, so, and this, I will go back to a, a quote by Carl Sagan again, where he said, you know, uh, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. So if you're gonna claim that this is an alien spaceship, fine, but show me extraordinary evidence, not just marginal, you know, arguments. Uh, and so, so it doesn't quite meet the, the standard yet, but it's very intriguing. 
it's very intriguing that we have the interstellar uh, visitors uh, and you know we might actually have a lot more than we realized in the past we just have better ways of detecting them now and realizing uh, and sort of understanding their orbits uh, but I think that's something to watch over the next few years. We'll probably detect more and more of these, and it's going to be very exciting. Uh, what what uh, mesmerizes me about these objects is that some of them could be much older than the solar system. The solar system, you know, appeared in the sort of second half of the life of our galaxy, uh, but this object could be from the first half of the life of our galaxy, and it's just been tumbling along, minding its own business. And so you could have a rock like this that could be, I don't know, 10 billion years old, uh, which would be a sort of an amazing thing. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, we just don't know. So let's review these terms. R sub star, the rate of star formation today, uh, I won't insult you. These, this, this, these are, you know, beautiful images that you're familiar with. Stellar nurseries, uh, beautiful nebula uh, image by Hubble. Uh, I'll go straight to the bottom line. The number of star, the rate of star formation in our galaxy today is a number between 20 and 50. It's actually relatively well constrained. Uh, we don't expect this to be off by an order of magnitude at all. Uh, and for all, for the purpose of this particular presentation, I'll just go with 20. But you should bear in mind that you know it could be you know up to a little bit more than twice more than that. Okay, but. In astronomical terms, these are essentially the same numbers, okay? So what's the fraction of those stars that are formed that have planets around them? So the process of planetary formation was, of course, uh, you know, understood, at least modeled theoretically before this new recent wave of discovery of exoplanets. But now we do understand from especially Kepler's survey, but also the ongoing TESS mission and uh, other similar surveys that exoplanets are not uncommon. And the latest, and incidentally, you're probably familiar with this as well, but uh, Kepler, of course, was detecting uh, these planets by planetary eclipses of their, of, or partial eclipses of their uh, home star. And so you, you can see the light curve of a planet of the star, sorry, that, that's dimming a little bit as the planet transits that, that star. And of course, you have to assume here that you're looking at a, at a star system edge on. And so since statistically, most star systems will not be seen edge on, you can, you can correct for that. In other words, you, you can, you know, the, once you've observed how many planetary transits uh, were detected by Kepler, you can that up that number uh, to take into account those planetary systems that you, you statistically would not have seen edge on and for which you would have missed this planetary transit. Okay, so anyway, with these corrections in place, we now think that about 50% of stars, okay, 50%, and that's taking into account the smaller things like the brown dwarfs uh, to the larger things that are, you know, uh, more complex binary or ternary systems. Uh, but roughly speaking, the, fr the fraction of, of planets, of, of star systems that have a planetary system around them is roughly 50%. Okay, so that's the number I'm using here. Uh, once you have a planet, a planetary system, what's the number of environments in that planetary system that are going to be suitable for life? And of course, we are familiar with this Goldilocks zone uh, concept where the dimmer your star is, the closer in you need to be for liquid water to be stable at the surface of your planet. The larger the star, the farther out you can be. The sun is shown here at the top uh, as a G-type star with our planetary system and Mars and Venus sort of bracketing the, the Goldilocks zone of our, of our planetary system. Okay, But this would be a very narrow definition of the number of environments that are suitable for life uh, in a planetary system. Because it doesn't, it, this is only in relation to your heliocentric or your star centric distance. Uh, what about places like Jupiter and beyond? So, uh, we're focusing on Mars first. Mars, of course, is at the outer edge of our Goldilocks zone. Uh, it seems to have experienced liquid water at its surface and even possibly today 
uh, under some circumstances. Um, but the, the point about Mars though, is that there has to be liquid water underground even today. You just have to go deep enough uh, to the point where the geothermal gradient, the, the, the rate at which temperature increases into the ground uh, reaches the liquidus uh, of, of water. And so where the ice essentially in the ground turns into, into water at depth. Okay, so it's sort of the same experience we have with going down into mines where it gets warm and warm as you go deeper. Well, at some point you, you get to the point on Mars where water, which is abundantly available uh, in the subsurface is just gonna be liquid. So there has to be a, a large uh, global aquifer uh, on Mars and that's predicted by models, but that's also just predicted by, uh, you know, common sense on the composition of Mars globally. Uh, and what that liquid water zone might contain is a big mystery. Okay, and I, for one, would like us to to head in the direction of exploring the subsurface of Mars as soon as possible. Uh, so Mars's surface might be uh, sterile today, too dry, uh, too much radiation. Uh, temperature differences that are very stark, but it could be radically different at depth. If you go down two to five kilometers on Mars, then you might encounter a realm that has liquid water commonly and circulating uh, underground. Uh, there are also the local thermal anomalies like the volcanoes. These volcanoes on Mars are not erupting right now, but they, these, the volcanoes are not thought to be extinct. They might just be dormant. Uh, something like Olympus Mons has probably been, probably been geologically active for about 2 billion years. So for the bulk of the history of Mars, this volcanic center has been uh, erupting episodically. And so chances are, are that it is still active. There must be still a magma chamber uh, at depth underneath this, uh, this volcano. Uh, it's just not erupting right now. But this also raises sort of the interesting um, possibility that if one day one of these volcanoes were to awaken, uh, you could actually have an eruption on Mars. And that would be a spectacular thing to, to sort of go after, of course. I'm showing you at the bottom, uh, Mount Everest, of course, that little speck in the middle compared to Olympus Mons to scale. So this is the proper vertical and horizontal scale uh, this is how much higher Olympus Mons is and how much broader uh, it is as well compared to Mount Everest. So it's a 600 kilometer wide shield volcano that is 22 kilometers uh, above the, the local base of the, of the cliffs. All right, now these volcanoes are interesting because they offer windows into the interior of Mars. We have now identified on Mars a number of skylights into, so these are collapsed lava tubes, essentially on the flanks of these volcanoes. One of my favorite uh, skylights is this one. It's called the Jean Pit. It's on Arcia Mons, one of the trios of the Tharsis region. And this thing is about 200 meters in diameter. Uh, the depth is uh, unknown. Uh, if you look at these other examples of um, lava tube skylights on Mars and you stretch the image, um, you eventually are able to bring up the bottom of these pits. And you, normally what you usually see is some boulders and some sand dunes. Uh, but this particular one, uh, that doesn't help. You can stretch it to hell and you will just still see just darkness. And so... <laughs> Uh, this thing is uh, to fall, as far as we can tell, is a bottomless pit. And uh, it, it is probably at least 175 meters deep. Okay. Uh, so I have a painting here on the right. It's an oil painting I did that's imagining humans uh, rappelling down, well, uh, riding a, uh, a ride down into this uh, pit only to discover rock glaciers inside and, uh, and possibly life. Now, what's interesting about these cavities, of course, is that now you're entering a domain of Mars that is shielded from radiation. So it's a sheltered environment. 
It's shielded from the stark temperature changes during the day and night. Uh, it's shielded from micrometeorite bombardment. Uh, it might benefit from the warmth of the volcano still, if it's still active. Uh, there might be liquid water available more so than elsewhere. And so you could actually have a, an environment here that is really suitable for, for life as we know it. Uh, and that to me is really intriguing. So the point about Mars is that even though from a Goldilocks zone standpoint, it's, it's barely suitable for life in terms of availability of environments, um, it, it actually on a global scale, considering its depth as well, uh, qualifies as a place that would be suitable for, for Earth life. Uh, Jupiter. Uh, Carl Sagan and Edwin Saltpeter have imagined, <clears throat> and this is described in Cosmos, uh, life in the atmosphere of Jupiter. And so here are their floaters and hunters. Um, these are essentially buoyant beings or creatures that are floating up and down in the atmosphere of Jupiter, deep enough in the atmosphere that they are shielded from uh, ionizing radiation yet high enough in the atmosphere that they're not cooked uh, or subject to you know, uh, huge pressures. And so there might be this uh, Goldilocks zone, as it were, in the atmosphere of Jupiter, where you are sort of in a place that's relatively uh, clement. Uh, Europa, of course, is one of these other places. So it's not just these giant planets, but their moons that might be offering environments, environments that are suitable for, for life. Europa is, of course, uh, this second Galilean satellite of Jupiter. It has a global icy crust. It's about 20 kilometers thick. And then an ocean underneath it that's about 100 kilometers deep. And if you think about the fact that the deepest point in the Earth's oceans is about 11 kilometers, um, <clears throat> a hundred kilometer deep ocean is very deep. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so here is a sort of an artist depiction of the crust of Europa, uh, the ice thickness underneath it. Uh, and well, that's part of the crust of Europa and then the liquid water ocean underneath. Okay. All right. And then this is actually a, an oil painting I did uh, that imagines a, a creature uh, lurking right underneath one of these lineae, these uh, lineations that you see at the surface, crisscrossing the, the surface, the icy surface of Europa. These, these lineations are probably just cracks in the ice that have broken up um, uh, over time, during times of um, uh, higher tides possibly, or, or just uh, warmer phases. Okay. Of course, we don't know that there's life on in Europa's ocean, but that's actually a prime target to, to go explore. If anything, if the oceans of Europa had essentially as much life uh, in terms of density of life as the oceans of the Earth, then the bulk of the biomass in the solar system would be in Europa, not on Earth, which is sort of a remarkable possibility. Uh, Ganymede might have... Uh, sort of a sludgy ocean as well at depth. And then of course, going beyond, you have Saturn's atmosphere, which is uh, also has clouds of water, a uh, bit of ammonia and uh, other things that might be enjoyable for some forms of life. And of course, Titan. So this is a nice view from Cassini, one of my favorites. It shows you uh, Titan in the distance, the rings of Saturn seen edge on, and then uh, Enceladus, uh, just below the ring plane there too, the, the white little blob. Uh, this is actually a painting I did of the surface of Titan, but Titan is an intriguing place. It has an atmosphere of nitrogen, 98% of the composition of the atmosphere of, of Titan is, is nitrogen. Uh, and the major secondary component is, is, is methane. It, there's about one to 2% of methane in the atmosphere. Then the rest is a little bit of hydrogen and that's pretty much it. Uh, now, of course, there are other organic compounds that are in trace amounts, but they are dangerously uh, dangerous compounds. For example, hydrogen cyanide. Um, and just as a side comment here, 
uh, I've actually been working on a project lately on trying to design a spacesuit uh, for Titan. I mean, Titan's gravity is even lower than the gravity of the moon. It, lunar gravity is 0.17 G. Okay, Titan's gravity is 0.14 G. Uh, meanwhile, the atmosphere is two bars, okay, two atmospheres. So it's twice as thick as the Earth's atmosphere. It's made of nitrogen, which will do nothing to you in terms of harmfulness. Uh, but the remarkable thing about a spacesuit that an astronaut could wear on Titan is that it doesn't have to be pressurized. You do not need a pressurized spacesuit to survive on Titan. Okay, so you just have to stay warm. The temperatures are very cold. It's about 94 Kelvin at the surface. So that's minus uh, 180 degrees Celsius. Uh, but other than that, uh, so you want to stay warm. You want to have sort of a suit that looks like a giant parka. And then, of course, you have to be shielded from these toxic gases, these toxic fumes, okay, uh, like hydrogen cyanide. So what the Titan spacesuit ends up looking like is something like a level A chemical suit. So it's sort of a full body suit that, you know, that you might see sometimes in these sci-fi movies, but it's, it's used commonly in the oil and gas industry or in the industry of, of of uh, management of toxic waste, um, you, you know, a level A full body suit, DuPont makes one and other companies do as well, uh, except that you would want one that would be very warm uh, and would uh, keep you shielded. And then once, when you're wearing one of these suits, you need to be wearing a face mask as well inside with an oxygen supply in your backpack, okay, to, to keep you uh, oxygenated. Um, so, you know, so that you can breathe while you're going on your EVAs, but otherwise your suit is not pressurized, which is sort of remarkable. And incidentally, it'd be a lot easier to fly as well on Titan because of the low gravity and the, and the denser atmosphere. So, you know, you could, uh, you could do, uh, you know, these uh, squirrel suit dives uh, pretty easily on Titan and without much danger. Okay. Uh, then we move on to Enceladus, which is also a target, ice as well, followed by an ocean underneath, a little bit less deep, about maybe 60 kilometers of, uh, of water underneath the crust of Enceladus, an intriguing place as well. Uh, here we're actually seeing uh, squirt water, water vapor, and probably water ice crystals being squirted out into space through some of these cracks that are crisscrossing the surface of, uh, of Enceladus, uh, you know, um, as the tides uh, stir the, the liquid ocean underneath. So uh, I want to sort of pause here just to summarize this, okay? Even in our own solar system, there could be more than, there could be about 10 environments that are suitable for life today. Uh, so it's not just the Earth's surface. And if you, if you separate the Earth's surface from the Earth's underground, uh, then you, know, you are easily even at more than 10, okay? So that's not to say that that's a number that's representative of every planetary system, but the point is, it's, it is not the case that somehow the Earth is the only place that would be habitable for things like microbes in our solar system. There are other environments that we think would be quite suitable for, for microbial life. Uh, and then another consideration is that beyond this notion of Goldilocks zone and even uh, internal environments to planets and satellites, you also, there's also the bigger picture of where you are in our galaxy. Uh, if you're too close to the galactic center, then the density of stars is too high. And then now you're at risk of getting fried uh, and your life being destroyed and killed by um, these powerful gamma ray bursts, okay, which are associated with, with um, supernovae in particular. Uh, so uh, here's a plot actually that shows you uh, that your probability of existing gets really low when you are near the galactic center, okay? So let's say you had everything going for you except that you, were, you are around a star that ends up being very close to the galactic center. Well, then you're in trouble because gamma ray bursts will be very frequent and these will be resetting events for life on your planet. Uh, and so we on the Earth happen to be just far out enough at this point uh, to have only a 40 to 50 percent probability of getting completely wiped out by these gamma ray bursts. OK, but otherwise, you're not in very good shape if you're exposed to those uh, nearer to the galactic center. 
So again, this is, you know, in some sense, we are at the inner edge of the Goldilocks zone, so to speak, from a gamma ray burst standpoint in our galaxy. Okay, so just for our discussion, I will submit to you that rather than considering that N sub E is 10, which is a bit extreme, maybe as an average number, uh, it's certainly not a very small number. There's no, you know, there's no particular reason to think that it's very small. And so I'll suggest that a conservative or reasonable estimate is that N sub E is about one, okay? What about F sub L? The fraction of those planets that are suitable for life where life actually appears, okay? Well, how hard is it for life to appear? Uh, in the 50s, Stanley Miller and Harold Urey conducted this famous Urey Miller experiment uh, where they put a mixture of gases that they thought might be common on early earth, methane, ammonia, water, hydrogen, and they zap these gases with uh, electrodes carrying 10,000 volts of, of, of differential. Uh, and, uh, and sure enough, what was collected as, uh, as water, was, water and vapor was run through this mixture, what was collected were a number of organic compounds, including amino acids. So amino acids, which of course are the building blocks of proteins in our bodies and are therefore used also in, in DNA, uh, amino acids are a natural product of chemical processes, such as mixing basic gases that might be present in early atmospheres and zapping them with things that are, you know, common in lightning. Okay. Uh, so having said that, although we've managed to produce amino acids, we, we haven't quite yet managed to produce self-replicating RNA uh, that is very sophisticated. We were sort of at the edge of having achieved that. There are some examples in the lab where RNA-like compounds have started to be produced, have started to be produced by these um, basic chemistry experiments where they could self-replicate in very sort of modest ways. But we're, we're a far cry from this being called uh, really biology yet. We're, we're just looking at some some uh, sort of some chemical startups, if you will. And uh, what might be missing in all this, of course, is sort of two factors. One is uh, a much larger medium in which chemical reactions can happen. And so that's sort of a statistical argument. You can produce some products in a sort of a lab, but only if, if you could, if only you could have a, uh, a jar the size of an ocean, well, then now you would have a lot more chances of producing other things that are a lot more interesting. So that's one argument. And the other, of course, is time. Uh, you, you just don't have enough time when you run a lab experiment. You know, it's not just a few days or a few years that you would need, but let's say a million years. Uh, then you would really produce you know, some really interesting things. So these two factors are very difficult to produce in the lab. They're very difficult to even model, uh, you know, with with uh, computers, but that's sort of what we are left with uh, having to do, either that or going to places that might be caught halfway in this process. And this is why Titan is such an interesting place because it might be a place where organic chemistry, even though is, it's been having a hard time going very far because of the temperatures being so cold, it might've been going on long enough that we might be seeing some of these intermediate steps uh, reflected in the goop that is at the surface of Titan, okay? Uh, so anyway, on Earth, the general thinking is that life started in the oceans. Uh, in fact, uh, at the bottom, well, uh, most likely at the bottom of the oceans near hydrothermal vents uh, like this. And that's because some of the earliest forms of life are hydrothermal in origin. This is not an example of a hydrothermal form of life, uh, but there are papers out there that show you these filaments, for example, which are, which are thought to be the product of hydrothermal activity, well, bio, biology in, in the context of hydrothermal vents, okay? Uh, what I'm showing you here is one of the, the first examples of a, of a segmented bacterium that was uh, sort of identified in the fossil record and dates back to about 3.5 to 3.8 billion years uh, ago on the earth. Uh, so, uh, the key message, though, to understand here is that in the big picture of life on Earth, uh, 
life appeared very early in the history of the Earth. The creation of the Earth about 4.6 billion years ago. The oldest rocks we know of are about 4 billion years old. And essentially, as soon as we find some of these rocks in the form of sedimentary rocks that would have essentially captured a biosignature uh, from the water that was available at the time, we find a record of life. We find biosignatures. So what this tells you is that whatever process took place on the earth, it allowed, it allowed life to appear very early. Okay. Not intelligent life, but basic early life forms capable of leaving a fossil record. That was, that happened very, very early. And so if you are to generalize this to other planets, the implication here is that starting life is easy. It happened very early. It didn't take a long time on earth for it to appear. As soon as you had oceans for a long time and sedimentary rocks deposited, next thing you know, you have signs of life captured in them. And that tells you that if the earth is representative of the rest of the galaxy, which is a big if, uh, if that is representative, then <clears throat> the message here is that life starts easily and therefore early on any planet that has environments that are suitable for life. So the implication here is that uh, F sub L might be far from being zero. If you have a planet that is environmentally suitable for life, well then life uh, has a good chance of appearing. Uh, and I'm calling this 50%, 0.5, just because it's somewhere in between zero and one. Uh, and it's more on the uh, sort of helpful side of one. Okay, in other words, it's far away from being just a zero. Uh, and what this again is in, intended to reflect is, is the ease with which life appears. Okay, maybe not everywhere, but it didn't seem like it was difficult on Earth. It appeared very early. Okay. Uh, I want to point out as well that there are some interesting adaptations of life, uh, even to uh, environments that might be, you know, that one might not consider very suitable for life. This is an image of Dinococcus radiodurans. So some of you might be familiar with Dinococcus radiodurans. It's a, it's, a, it's a unicellular organism. So this is one unicellular organism. It's just that its cell is partitioned into uh, three or four compartments, four in this case, where you have four copies of the exact same DNA for that organism. And it's a, it's a dinococcus in the sense that it's a you know, unicellular, relatively primitive organism, but it's called radiodurance because one of the attributes of this design is that it endures radiation, radiodurance, okay? If any one of these DNA strands gets damaged by radiation, the three others kick in as copies to make sure that you're going to repair yourself properly uh, and therefore your DNA is preserved. Okay, so this is a remarkable adaptation in nature. We don't exactly know why Dinococcus radiodurans has this design. Uh, it is actually unique on the earth. Um, it's, it's still an organism that fits in the tree of life on earth, so we don't think it's alien. Um, it actually doesn't survive well in zero pressure. So if you take this thing to space or in simulated space conditions, it doesn't like it, it's gonna die. So it's not like it is somehow traceable to an extraterrestrial origin. Uh, you know, you might think that this is the perfect thing that for, for space travel, but it isn't. Uh, it does not like low pressure, okay? But on the other hand, it uh, really doesn't mind too much high radiation environments. And incidentally, I'm wondering if one day we could modify ourselves uh, genetically, not that I would recommend that, but if we're gonna do it at all, well, we might as well do something like this to ourselves to, to create cells that are able to repair themselves. That way we're you know, protected from cancer and, and radiation damage and space travel becomes a piece of cake. Okay, what fraction of planets where life actually appears becomes uh, intelligent, and let's define that. So we're gonna define this a bit arbitrarily, but as you can see, mathematically, it doesn't make much difference. If you define intelligence as being the emergence of say the beaver, well then the next step 
to go from beaver to an advanced civilization will take a little bit longer and we'll, we'll have a lower probability and therefore we'll just uh, compensate for the fact that your intelligence appeared sooner by defining it as the beaver as opposed to sort of homo erectus. Uh, on the other hand, if you define the intelligence as being pretty much like us already now, well, then the civilization is right there as well. And then, you know, you, you have a smaller number for F sub I, but then a larger number for F sub C. Yeah. Okay, so it doesn't matter too much how you define intelligence. Uh, here, we're going to define it as the emergence of Homo erectus about a million to two million years ago. Okay, so this is Homo erectus. The first... Um, of our ancestors or cousin ancestors that really stood erect and uh, therefore freed his or her hands from uh, ambulation and was able to use um, his or her hands to make stuff and carry stuff. Okay, so this is a portrayal of Mr. and Mrs. Homo erectus. They seem to be fending off some threat or is it the taxpayer? I mean, the, the tax collector, uh, we're not sure, but um, here they are in the steppes of Western Africa about a million to 2 million years ago. Okay. Now notice that, that they were known to use tools, uh, not necessarily make tools, but they were known to use tools. Um, uh, you know, you, you, find, you find their remains with sharp rocks and, and animal carcasses, which shows that they were using rocks to, to cut up their prey. Okay. Now, the key thing that's interesting here is that it took a long, long time for intelligence to emerge on Earth. It was not at all a straightforward path. It's not like it, it was bound to happen. And somehow, it, you know, there were several, several close calls, N not even close, okay? It took the, the vagaries of evolution over four and a half billion years, pretty much, of life on Earth to eventually end up with Homo erectus at the very top uh, of, the, uh, of this uh, time schedule, meaning very late in the Earth's history. So a billion years ago is, is just yesterday, geologically speaking. And we now understand, of course, how this happened. I mean, for all intents and purposes, uh, the bulk of Earth's history uh, was dominated by microbial life. What this particular scale shows you here is just the, the last 600 million years or so. Okay, what was shown before was the past 4.6 billion. This is just the last 600 million. And before the Cambrian explosion, life on Earth was, uh, on average, really very, very simple. Uh, the Cambrian explosion is an event that took place about 550 million years ago where life on Earth diversified, uh, it radiated, uh, meaning it, it uh, you know, a number of forms appeared uh, relatively suddenly, geologically speaking, uh, at the bottom of these Cambrian seas. And the Cambrian explosion, of course, was followed by eventually the emergence of actually fish, of land plants, of amphibians, of reptiles, uh, dinosaurs, and then the dinosaurs ruled the earth for close to, you know, 150 to 200 million years. Um, and there was no end in sight until, of course, 66 million years ago, uh, the Chicxulub impact event took place. Uh, and then all of a sudden, the dinosaurs were ripe, wiped out, probably mainly through the collapse of the ecosystem. Uh, and what that cleared the way for was the emergence of, of mammals. Mammals had appeared relatively early along with the dinosaurs you can see that the, the boundary between the permian and the triassic is when the first dinosaurs and the mammals appeared okay but the mammals were completely um uh, sort of oppressed so to speak and kept very simple very primitive because of the reign of the dinosaurs in part uh, and they were just not at the top of the food chain it, it took the demise of the dinosaurs which was the result of a relatively random event uh, to allow the mammals who were burrowing mostly uh, and therefore were able to luckily survive the impact event and its consequences to sort of take off evolution from an evolutionary standpoint and led to, to, um, to our ancestors. Okay. 
who incidentally didn't show up for another 65 million years. Okay, so the impact took place 66 million years ago. Homo erectus, that was just a million years ago. All right. So how do you estimate then the fraction of planets on which life has appeared and on which intelligent life eventually appears? Well, you want, it's not easy to do, of course. On the Earth, it's a matter of contrasting how late intelligence appeared compared to how early life itself appeared. And so this is where this fraction comes into play. Uh, F sub i here is calculated by estimating roughly the ratio of 1 million years over the age of the Earth. Okay. And uh, it could be 4.6 billion. It could be 4 billion. doesn't make a huge difference. F sub i is roughly uh, in, this, in this estimate uh, two ten thousandths okay, of, of one. Okay. So... Um, 0.0002, okay? And again, there, there's no easy, precise way to estimate this. So one way to do that is just to compare how long Homo erectus, uh, how long it took Homo erectus to appear versus the age of the earth, okay? And that, that is what, well, actually the inverse of that, and that's what results in 0.0002, okay? So what this means is that the fraction of planets on which there is life and on which life actually becomes intelligent is not large. It took so long on earth for intelligence to appear. If this is a trend that is common to other planets with life, that means that you could have a universe or a galaxy that's teeming with planets with life because life appeared very early in Earth's history, but where it's not intelligent life, it's mostly microbial, Maybe they got to the point where they have the equivalent of dinosaurs and other, other things going on, but just not anything like Homo erectus. There is no clear path that led to that, no urgency to the emergence of, of Homo erectus. So what fraction of those planets where Homo erectus appears, uh, so to speak, turns into an advanced civilization capable, therefore, of interstellar communication? Well, uh, we define our maturation into an intelligent civilization, uh, one that's capable of interstellar communication as, as being the time when we understood Maxwell's equations, okay? When we came up with Maxwell's equations. Here, here are Maxwell's equations. They basically demonstrate uh, our understanding that electro and magnetic waves, uh, well, electric fields and magnetic fields combine together to form electromagnetic waves and therefore, we now understand how radio waves work and also how light works. Okay, so the capital B here in these equations is the magnetic field. The capital E is the electric field. And then these other variables essentially are showing you how these two terms are intertwined, okay, and, and how they behave. So, so when Maxwell, uh, who is a Scottish physicist, came up with Maxwell's equations, uh, I'll, I'll submit to you that we can define us at that point as being uh, an advanced civilization, okay? So it took about a million years to go from Homo erectus. This is the example of the Java man, uh, Sangiran 17, who was around seven, about a million years ago, to James Clerk uh, uh, Maxwell, uh, Homo sapiens sapiens, in 1854 here, okay? You can see that, uh, uh, well, beards haven't made much progress or hairstyles, but on the other hand, uh, in terms of our understanding of physics, there was a giant leap there that took place in this million years, okay? And so, uh, and we of course have to understand too that uh, it's not necessarily a number that's going to be one, right? It's just, just because Homo erectus shows up on a planet doesn't necessarily mean uh, that you end up very quickly with, a, with an advanced civilization, okay? And here's an example of why maybe not. You could imagine a planet that's mostly an ocean where somehow life evolves intelligence, uh, you know, like, like orcas here on earth, which are thought to be very social and very smart, but you know you, you might consider them to be equivalent to Homo erectus in terms of intelligence, but uh, they they are incapable 
uh, biologically, morphologically to come up with technology. They, they're not using their hands. They can't really modify the environment. Uh, and so they might be doomed essentially to sort of uh, Peter or, or just stay intelligent, but not civilized. Okay. And so uh, again, there could be many ocean planets out there with very intelligent life in them uh, if it had time to show up, but somehow they are not uh, doing astronomy. They're not building radio telescopes. They're not understanding uh, the world around them. Uh, so this number F sub C might be not one, but 0.1, maybe one in 10, okay? Uh, could become an advanced civilization. So you, you might argue that this is a large or small number, but that's, that's about it. And then finally, what's the longevity of a civilization? How, how long, once we become capable of interstellar communication, how long do we last? Okay, well, you can imagine that we, if you consider you know, us being a continuum since the dawn of civilization in the Valley of the Nile with ancient Egypt, uh, we've lasted about 5,000 years, okay, as a sort of a human society and civilization. Although technically, uh, civilizations don't usually last more than 500 years to, to about 1,000 years, okay? Uh, I mean, some places like China that were relatively isolated, uh, you know, have lasted a few thousand years. Uh, and, you know, but maybe the perspective to keep here is that, okay, let's consider ourselves to be to being a human society that has been around for about 5,000 years. We haven't managed to completely destroy ourselves at any point yet. But uh, I'm sure you'll agree that we're not necessarily safe from destroying ourselves. Uh, and now that we actually can, uh, it could happen. Uh, so we could be wiped out by impacts. This is Houghton Crater on Devon Island in the Arctic, where we go every summer. It's a 20 kilometer impact structure. It uh, formed when uh, a bolide about one kilometer in size uh, fell about 23 million years ago. Okay, so what if this happened uh, today? It wouldn't be a global extinction event, but something larger like Chicxulub would, would wipe out uh, probably most life on Earth still. Okay. Uh, there's also the threat of population growth and therefore famines. Okay. This, these are three possible outcomes predicted by the UN, uh, depending on what we do and how things go in terms of population growth beyond the present. And so it's currently looking like we're somewhere along the uh, yellow curve, uh, but global population is still increasing and uh, at an alarming rate. And we're not, we're not out of the woods in terms of being uh, susceptible to, to population explosions on our planet. Uh, then we have the pandemics. This is a painting I did actually to, uh, to mark this incredible moment of we're living, all of us, with this uh, COVID pandemic, but imagine something that, you know, would actually target children uh, instead of uh, older people or a virus that would somehow target uh, young adults. You know, I mean, it, it could have really uh, catastrophic consequences for, for society and, and how we could, uh, how we would survive. And of course, there, the danger that we are to ourselves, uh, you know, with war and especially nuclear war but also biological weapons and things like that. Uh, so here I'm showing in a painting how uh, it's unclear whether we actually have a great future. It could be that in the future, uh, this era of human civilization will just be a, a thin layer of rust in the geological record of the earth called the Anthropocene. Okay, and that following our, our, uh, our time on earth, uh, we will just have ocean sediments and, uh, and life sort of picks up from there. Uh, so what is this number L? Uh, I'll be neither optimistic or pessimistic. Um, I don't think there's any particular reason to somehow assume that we can last a million years, which is what some of these estimates uh, would like to assume. Of course, a larger number of for L will pump up the number N, uh, I think 10,000 years is actually optimistic because it's twice as long as we've been around as a civilization on the earth. Uh, so, so maybe that is, you know, a possible number. So what does this end up giving us? Well, 
in this talk, I've made the case, or at least argued that uh, if you use these relatively reasonable numbers for the various terms of the Drake equation, you multiply them together, this is the answer that you get, one, okay, one. Not 10,000, not 50 million, one. And of course, again, there are error bars to all this. So we could be off by one order of magnitude, uh, two orders of magnitude. Uh, in fact, some terms we were not even sure we could be off by three orders of magnitude. The longevity of a civilization, we really have no big idea about that. But still, uh, the fact that with just some reasonable assumptions, all we end up with is one is really food for, for pause. Um, you know, maybe we are it, okay? Maybe the Fermi paradox is not a paradox. Maybe there aren't that many out there, which is why we don't see them. Um, you know, if, if it is true that at any given time in a galaxy, even of our size, there's only about one civilization that's advanced enough to, to communicate by radio waves, uh, then that does several things. It, it forces some sense of responsibility for us. I mean, we really need to take care of ourselves. It's not like we're going to be saved by some other alien civilization that's going to come in just in time as we are messing up our own planet uh, in the future. Uh, it also means that, um, you know, we might be profoundly alone, even though we would be the product of natural processes, natural chemical and biological evolution. Uh, it doesn't mean that we're a, we're a common outcome. Uh, it could be that we are just really rare as an outcome. It doesn't make us divine by quite, quite so, but at the same time, it means that we are pretty special. And, uh, you know, we, we're really not sure what's in store for us. What should we do? Should we, should we venture out into space? Is there really a future? Or are we just doomed just because of the sheer vastness of time and, and space? Uh, so I'm, I'm sort of left with uh, a sense of, uh, of real doubt uh, about you know what this all means. If we're not a com if we're just profoundly lonely, then uh, you know for one thing, our chances of finding another civilization in our galaxy are, are essentially close to zero. And what we should really do, in my view, is focus our SETI search at this point on the nearest large galaxies, because if if each large galaxy has at least one civilization out there like us ourselves. Well, maybe some are already far, far enough ahead that we could detect them. So, so we should be probably looking for, for we might have a better chance of finding a, a bio-techno signature by looking at, at more distant uh, you know, sources that, that are collectively gathering billions of stars, such as a galaxy. So I would say, let's look at M33, let's look at M31, Andromeda, of course, and uh, 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 forget the other one. Uh, let's, uh, let's focus on, on galaxies as opposed to, to uh, you know, hitting, I mean, it's still worth it to look at some of the nearby stars, just in the off chance that this could be completely off. But uh, otherwise, our SETI search would be better, better done, I think, by extragalactic uh, SETI searches. Now, in the bigger picture, though, we still we would still be in a universe that's teeming with civilizations, because there's 100 billion galaxies out there, and so even if on average only there was only one civilization per galaxy, uh, we're still in pretty good company. It's just that everybody is is way out there. So, yeah, this is uh, with the color coded error bars in terms of orders of magnitude uncertainties on these terms. Okay. We might be it, or there is another. If there's only one other in our civilization, in our galaxy, it would be at about 50,000 light years from us, sort of across the galaxy. Um, you know, so that would make communicating with them very difficult too. Uh, I'll just end with a cartoon. Frank Drake celebrated his 90th birthday just last year. Uh, so this is an alien civilization in another galaxy coming up with the same equation because it's mathematically pretty straightforward. Uh, so it ought to be universal. So that evening, the workshop participants were treated to a presentation on the Eckhart equation. That's Drake spelled in reverse uh, by none other than Professor Narf Eckhart itself, <laughs> itself. 
That's Frank Drake spelled in reverse. Thanks, everybody. That's it. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yay. I agree. <laughs> it's... All right. We do have time for uh, some, some questions. Sorry it took so long. I have no idea what time it is. Oh, we still got a little bit of time. We got about maybe seven, eight minutes for questions. Oh, wow. Yeah, that, I blew the schedule. Sorry. Oh, no, that's fine. <laughs> that's, that's fine. Yeah, that's great. I was waiting right, to be soft. Uh, some, some questions. All right. So if anyone has any questions, just uh, unmute yourself and ask away. Just a completely off the wall uh, a question is, uh, do, have you done other cartoons sort of like that? Oh, yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> I, I have a website where I, uh, uh, pascallee.net, if you have really nothing better to do now. <laughs> you you Pas described it perfectly here. <laughs> pascallee.net. Yeah. Good. Yeah, it's the astronomer's uh, cartoonist, huh? I, I do have a question. Yeah. Uh, since these uh, other uh, uh, solar systems within our galaxy are well, could be uh, hundreds of thousands of years uh, in, in in the past when we see them. Yes. Uh, we're not going to be able to communicate with anybody, uh, as, uh, and uh, quite definitely uh, other galaxies, because what we're looking at is uh, something that occurred millions of years ago yes yes you're absolutely right we're not talking about communicating we're talking about detecting them you're right yeah yeah you're yeah, absolutely right and it's the next even, step you know detecting them and hopefully to communicate but chances of communicating with any civilization that is out there is, is almost zero yeah and it, you know especially if you if you put into perspective our own lifespans i mean we we yeah. ourselves live what a few decades and so you know this means that if you hope to send a signal and receive an answer within your lifetime, you, you're talking to about limiting yourself to maybe, you know, uh, a couple, I mean, 20 to 30 light years. Uh, that's, that's pretty much it. So you're not far out into the galaxy at all. Even in a scenario where we were two civilizations at this time in the galaxy, <laughs> where, the other one, where the other one would be at, say, 50,000 light years from us, I mean, uh, our galaxy is about 100,000 light years across. So, you know, there's only two of us. We, average distance might be 50,000 light years. Well, you send a signal, but then bear in mind that in this assumption, our own longevity is only 10,000 years. <laughs> so, so our signal won't even get to them before we're dead in this assumption, before we're all gone as a civilization. So how does that mean then that we're going to locate them or find or know that they were there? It's, it's very hard. We, I think that what, um, what the, there's a wild card in all this when I mean, there's several wild cards, but one of the wild cards is essentially what technology, where technology goes, because, you know, I, I often quote Arthur C. Clarke on this. Uh, he said, any, sufficiently advanced technology is, un, is indistinguishable from magic. And so, you know, imagine that we had a civilization that was, well, in other words, what, what are we going to be capable of doing in say, you know, 5,000 years or 10,000 years? I mean, will we be able to do interstellar travel? Will we have found a way to go through wormholes? Will we, Will we have uh, found a way to, to, to go through large black holes? You don't want the small ones because you get squeezed too tightly. But the larger ones, maybe you, you, you don't get completely squished. Um, you know, it's just it's so big that uh, you, you sort of ride the tide. Uh, uh, so anyway, who knows? Uh, if, if, you, if you are able to somehow change the odds of reaching out to others and, and uh, traveling through space and time, well, then now all bets are off, you know? I mean, 
The, the SETI Institute, interestingly, doesn't accept funding for things like UFO research. Okay, I mean, there are plenty of people actually who are donors who would, who would donate to us to, to make us uh, do more research on UFOs and all this. And I always have a, I'm always of a split opinion about this because on the one hand, we really, we really don't want to take on that money because, you know, most UFO believers or, or sort of reports are hokey in the sense that they're probably not alien spacecraft. But on the other hand, if you're serious about your SETI search and the assumptions about civilization being out there, you should really be open to the fact that you might be visited. Right. I mean, we are an interesting place uh, and we're loud. Uh, and, you know, we, we could have been on people's radar, so to speak, for quite a while. Uh, so, so one should be open to, to, to interstellar travel within the galaxy. And, and, and so I guess we don't take on the, we don't take the UFO money because we, we are, we somehow managed to get funded without it. But uh, uh, I'm actually quite open to the notion that, you know, we should be really open-minded about uh, techno signatures. Okay. So, so what manifestation would an alien civilization have of its presence and so to answer to answer your your good question is, you know, what would it take to to communicate or, or to know about them? I think we we just have to be really keep our eyes peeled. <laughs> there's and there's always the uh, the dark force theory. There's always a dark force. Yes. Hey Pascal, I was wondering if you've ever been asked to speak in Roswell, New Mexico. <laughs> no, uh, no. Although if you have a connection there, I'll uh, I'd gladly do that. I actually have a theory about Roswell. Okay, which is that um, what was probably uh, actually, uh, I mean, do you, do you want to hear this or not? Because it's a bit yeah. off topic. Okay. Yeah. Sure. So as you know, Roswell, the, the nutshell is that, you know, they, something fell from the sky, there, there was metallic foil involved, and then they recovered three bodies uh, in suits. Uh, and... Uh, they were not humans and they were whisked away to a lab and then you never saw them again. Okay. And incidentally to a, to an air force lab, uh, I think Wright Patterson, if I'm not right. mistaken. Right. Okay. So, but to me, the, the simple explanation is this, uh, in the fifties, the U S air force, uh, was conducting a lot of high altitude ballooning flight tests and, in particular, one of the things that they were doing, as you know, the early space program in, in the US used monkeys. Uh, and it was the same thing in the Air Force. We were using monkeys to simulate the, the behavior of the human body, okay, at, um, at high altitude. And we were doing more than that. We were actually, one of the things that uh, we were trying to do was to have balloons, stratospheric balloons go around the earth allow them to drift over the Soviet Union and uh, train monkeys to take pictures by activating a leap. <laughs> okay, so, so, in, so, so here's, the, here's the context, okay? I mean, we were doing a lot of uh, that kind of flying with, with monkeys at high altitude, okay? Therefore, they were... So what would you do with these monkeys? You, first of all, you shave them because you, need, you put electrodes on their bodies. You need to know what they're doing. Uh, <laughs> Uh, biologically, you, they are in pressure suits, okay? And a shaved monkey has gray skin, which is what was reported. Uh, and one of these balloons, which is tracked by radar, which is why you have mylar, uh, just, just basically came down. And, and then now you're recovering three, bot, three shaved apes, which don't look familiar to anybody <laughs> who is not prepared for that. And the reason why it's covered up because of several things. It's a military program, so you're not going to talk about it. And second, uh, it opens the can of worms of how, uh, you know, we were treating animals. So the ethical behavior of animals remains an issue. And, you know, that's probably why it was canned forever. Uh, but that to me is the, is the, is my guess at what happened at Roswell. It had nothing to do with the UFO crash. The uh, movie Arrival and then the work of uh, Dr. Lawrence Doyle at Sutton yeah. Institute. 
yeah. uh, deals with the issue of communication. Even if we have the intelligence to communicate, does that necessarily mean that we could communicate with something so radically different than ourselves? Yeah. Yeah, I know Larry Doyle very well. He's a, he's a great guy to have around. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a good point. You know, even if they're there and they are super smart, we might not... Uh, <laughs> I mean, this is why math was probably a common language because, you know, in the end it's, uh, but what base maths, you know, you know, we, we use base 10 right. mathematics. I mean, we, we've sent actually signals as binary signals as well. Uh, but um, yeah, that, that, that's a whole issue as well. What, how we would communicate. Yeah. A non-technical question. What's your background picture from? Oh, that's uh, from the movie 2001, A Space Odyssey. Oh, yeah. So it's, it's uh, I can. Oh, yeah, I knew that one. I'll just remove myself here. <laughs> yeah, so uh, it's a moon base, basically, in the Stanley Kubrick sci fi movie. And uh, it shows, uh, it's actually uh, on the floor of a crater called Clavius. And Clavius crater came back in the news just a few weeks ago, or a few months ago. Uh, because the the Sophia telescope, the infrared flying observatory that the Boeing 747 that has an infrared telescope, uh, detected uh, water as in H2O molecules just sitting at the surface on the floor of, of Clavius Crater. Uh, cool. And so they, they, they looked elsewhere closer to the equator. They didn't see that, but they did not look elsewhere at the same latitude as Clavius. So it might not be limited to Clavius, but apparently at higher latitudes, Southern latitudes in this case on the moon, uh, conditions might be sufficient for, for water to be stable uh, as a molecule just trapped in the grains of the surface. So it's very interesting. You're still talking about amounts that are of order 100 parts per million. So, you know, you, you have to process 1 million tons of regolith to get one ton of water. But <laughs> uh, so it's not exactly a resource. But it's it's interesting. Do you work with colleges and universities? Uh, I've taken on uh, some visiting professor positions every now and then. I've I've taught at Cornell. Actually, I've taught at uh, University of Tennessee in Knoxville. Um, but uh, lately, I I haven't uh, done that too much. Yeah, I give talks. I give talks, the occasional talk, but you know. There seem to be more universities that are actually setting this up for something that you want to study and help people be educated. You fade out. Yeah, we can't hear you, Kathy. Uh, I'm so sorry. I'll try and type it up. Yeah, we hear you well now. No. Oh. Okay. Uh, I'm just curious. I know Penn State has just recently established a program, and it's called PSETI. And of course, they're going to do it across multiple colleges, not just you know exploratory uh, in the sky. So it's going to be geology. I'm sorry, I don't remember all of them. I was just curious if you knew much about that sort of uh, approach. No, I, I'm not uh, familiar with that particular program, but that doesn't mean um, much because I, I'm not necessarily tracking that very closely. Um, would you be doing similar things, do you think, without knowing too much about their program? Well, uh, you know, uh, what I've done is, is just reviewed the current state of our knowledge about the terms of the Drake equation, which is sort of a central guide in, in, the, in the SETI effort, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. I'm actually working uh, on a book, that little book that is going to summarize this whole story and it's called n equals one. <laughs> well, and I love it. Approximately equals one, uh, but uh, it, it, you know, and all we're, we're doing at the end of the book is recommending that we focus our attention on galaxies as opposed to our own galaxy, uh, and it it will exclude, of course, communicating with them, but it, it might actually increase our chances of detecting them. Uh, but um, I, I'm otherwise not involved in any specific effort uh, with SETI right now. Thank you. In your talk, you mentioned you showed a picture of an impact crater. Can you yeah. explain on that, please? 
Yeah, so that particular impact crater I showed is 20 kilometers in diameter. It's 23 million years old. It fell in the Arctic. At the time, it was already in the Arctic. Uh, it's on a place called it's in a place called Devon Island, which uh, is the largest uninhabited island on Earth. It's about the size of West Virginia, with even fewer people than in West Virginia. <laughs> I mean, it's, there's nobody there. Uh, and Devon Island is actually the the largest expanse, continuous expanse of rocky polar desert. So a climate that is dry and cold. So most of Alaska, for example, is uh, is tundra. Okay, so it's cold, but it's pretty wet and it's grassy. Uh, most of Siberia is taiga, which is cold, but actually forested. Uh, you have tundra farther north, of course. Uh, here you are so far north and so far east in the Arctic that you, you are in a climate that's cold and dry. And so nothing grows or very little grows. And so you are in what's called polar desert. Mars in that sense, is a global polar desert. So we go to Devon Island because it's one of the best Mars analogs on Earth, mm. uh, even though, of course, it's not nearly as cold or nearly as dry as Mars. Uh, but it's, it's sort of a, a good step in the right direction. And then the landscape on Devon shows so many uh, similarities with, with features on Mars. So this crater is actually of interest, too, in that context, because here, we, we know of about 200 to 250 impact craters on the earth, but most of them are pretty weathered. They are at southern latitudes. This thing is sitting there in the cold in the, in the freezer of time. And, uh, you know, it's very well preserved. If it wasn't smoking, I mean, it's not smoking, but if it was smoking, you, you, you could imagine it formed just yesterday. It's, it's so pristine. Uh, so uh, we've been going there for now for 25 years every summer, except this past summer because of COVID. Um, I, I often say that I, I often explain that I've lived in California now for 25 years and I have yet to spend a summer in California. I don't know what it's like to be at the beach in the summer in California, <laughs> which is sort of insane. Uh, I've been going to this godforsaken island every summer for the past 25 years. It's an amazing place. Now yeah, that's dedication. Yeah, but I think <laughs> if, you, if you got a chance to visit it, which I really wish to each one of you, you know, from as a human being to another human being, you, you got to make your way to Devon Island. It's an, it's an incredible place. <laughs> uh, you know, and it's just in Canada. It's, it's just in Canada. It's a matter of, you know, buying the plane ticket and making your way there. Um, so the crater is not weathered very much. Is there soil then? Uh, there's, there's a bit of soil development, but not a lot. The crater, you know, might have uh, lost about five meters of denudation over the past 23 million years. So it's, you know, it has been reworked a little bit by glacial processes and, uh, you know, uh, flushing of glacial meltwater, th things like that, a bit of erosion, but otherwise it's very well preserved. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. All right. Yeah. yeah we better uh, call it quits there. So uh, thanks again for joining us. That was a fantastic presentation and yeah, we, could, we could not have had a better crowd. Thank you. Uh, I'd be happy if you have follow-up questions or want to chat some more. I'm, I'm reachable at plee at seti.org. P-L-E-E -E at seti, S-E-T-I dot org. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, thanks Bye. again. Bye. Thank you. It's a privilege to talk to you all. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. All right, let's go ahead and move on with the uh, kind of open discussion portion of the meeting. I'll begin with the president's report as usual. Uh, I want to start off with uh, some really good news. A uh, little bit of background here real fast is last, at the end of last year, 2020, we hit an all-time record for membership of 191 you know, we've never breached 180 before last year, let alone 190. And I want to report as of right now, we are at 214 memberships. And counting families is two, that is well over 300 people. So I want to thank uh, all of our new supporters. Um, there are several reasons why we uh, pulled ahead so far is number one, we had a high retention rate from people that needed to renew this year. Normally we lose maybe 20, 25 people every year and then it takes us time to recover from that and then add on because mm -hmm. since really 1997, we 
have been progressively going uh, higher and higher and higher. But uh, number one, we retained a lot of people. And number two, much to my surprise, even though I've never mentioned it once, we've picked up a lot of new members from the introduction to amateur astronomy lecture series. And uh, many of those are from out of state, which does have me a little worried because what's going to happen toward the end of this year or whatever, <laughs> when it comes time to renew, are we going to have like the sudden, you know, so we'll see what happens. I hope those of you that joined out of state uh, stick with us. But I figured we would hit 200 uh, this year. I figured it would just take us uh, roughly half the year to do it. Because once we get into kind of maybe April, but definitely May, it, it doesn't really make sense to join. Because uh, after um, June 30th, membership is prorated. So you basically get the rest of the year for free, and then you're a member for the following year or the year after that, depending on how long you renew. So um, I, I just want to uh, thank everyone that uh, joined recently, and hopefully we'll uh, add on more uh, tomorrow because we'll, we'll we'll see how things go tomorrow. Yes, I'm a new member, uh, Joe Malik here in out of state in uh, Evanston, Illinois. Fantastic. <laughs> And uh, I belong to the Astronomical Society of Chicago, too. And uh, it's great having uh, two assets to, to tap into uh, because both have gr a great programs. Uh, I have a quick question, just a, uh, a repeat of something that was just said. What was that uh, address that the professor gave uh, to find him at, uh, at uh, SETI.com? If you just do a Google search, just uh, do a Google search for Pascal Lee, and you'll probably find his website. And I'm sure he has all of his contact information on there. Okay. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, P. Lee at SETI.org. Oh, he's still here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let the man in. How do you spell that? Uh, P like, uh, well, P like the letter, like Paul, P L E E at SETI, S E T I dot org, O R G. It's cheap. Yep, yep. Right. Dana posted it in the chat. Okay, thank you. Great. So uh, moving on here. Um, I'm going to already go now. Okay, bye everybody. Okay, thank you. okay. Hey, bye. So uh, one way we want to retain our members once we start meeting in person again is making sure we have all of our meetings online. I would prefer to live cast the meetings. You know, stream stream the meetings on Zoom or YouTube. Uh, but of course, we need a volunteer to do that. So from, from, from starting really last month and probably for the next several months, I'm going to bring this up every time. We need a volunteer or volunteers, of course, you have to live in the area, uh, to re uh, record, uh, edit, and post the meetings on YouTube. So you would be doing an extremely valuable service uh, to help us maintain all of these members. And if you did either renew or join uh, at least a, a month or two ago or, or further back, uh, you should have got a membership card in the mail uh, with the help of my parents because I can't have board members help me right now because they all have uh, Corona cooties is uh, I mailed out 120 membership cards. And so hopefully many of you got your membership card in the mail. And I just want to mention real fast, uh, as always, uh, create a KAS profile. If you are a uh, long time or even a new member, so you can go to the membership membership section of our website and uh, look for the member profile page. And there's a form to fill out to create your own member profile. Uh, moving on, I want to talk about the remote telescope real quick. Um, I do have some good news uh, regarding our flat field screen. So there it is. Can you see it? Yeah. <laughs> so it arrived uh, our new flat field screen arrived yesterday yeah that's it it's, it's, it's square it's white but believe it or not the, the, the stupid thing right here that's 1800 freaking dollars <laughs> so it, it, it's but it's a very high-end flat field screen it's going to be used with the uh, the big scope here the uh, playing wave the takahashi has a flip flap which is a separate flat field device because the homemade flat field screen here is just way too dim and it took forever to do some of the flat so we just got to get the thing installed that, you know, just arrived yesterday and, and we'll get that going. And we're going to hopefully make a push here soon to really get uh, people that have paid to use the remote telescope to actually use the remote telescope. 
One of the things I'm going to do, of course, is record a training video. I was going to try to do it again on Wednesday, but again, the winds were uh, high. It seems like every time I want to try to do this thing, uh, the weather um, <laughs> messes up on sure. me. And I, um, I, I'm thinking about it. I'm pretty sure I'll probably do it. But of course, our online viewing session season is now over. We go from November to February, but I'm going to do a informal uh, online viewing session probably on May 12th or May 13th if we have cloudy skies for the Messier Marathon. So this will be for members only. Um, I'll, I'll send out an email to all of our members and we'll do just a really formal session. I'll probably try to send out an email uh, to everyone a few days uh, or more before that because I'm going to get requests from the members. I, I, I'm not going to come up with anything to look at. It'll be up to you. You can decide what you want to look at and what scope you want to use to look at it with. We got the Takahashi and of course we got the 20 inch plane wave. I know a lot of people prefer the plane wave. So I'll probably Richard, send out an email about that uh, next week. Yeah. You, you're assuming that uh, if that's bad weather, this is a, if, if it's bad weather clouds well we we, we we could do it on a friday when we don't have the marathon but if we uh, have crummy skies for the marathon we can do it on saturday too hey richard yes uh you did say may do you, did you mean march i meant march they, they start with an m that's close enough <laughs> march, tw syllable. march 12th or march 13th <laughs> and um for for the next item for the remote telescope i want to hand it over to uh mike Patton, and he'll tell us what's going on out there because it might not be good uh -uh. yeah let me just, i know a lot of you guys know me but i'm assuming most people on this call do not but i reside in portal arizona which is the home of Arizona Sky Village, which is the home of the Kalamazoo Astronomical Society's remote telescope. The reason that telescope is here is because of the very dark skies out here. The portal area is also one of the top five bird watching areas in, in North America. Um, it's also a mecca for naturalists, be they bug people, uh, lizard people, whatever you can think of, they, it's area draws draws them in because of the biodiversity. What's happened is uh, two weeks ago, we were notified by a local realtor that a gentleman out of San Diego has filed for a special use permit to put in a cannabis grow house up on Community Road, which you don't know where that is, but it's about a mile north of right here. It'd be a 24 hour operation with translucent ceiling to let natural light in during the day. Um, it has not been approved yet. There's a public forum on Wednesday coming up. And when I first talked to Richard about this situation, uh, I thought we were going to ask all the members to at least dial in on the phone, mute the phone, but show that there's a lot of background uh, opposition. Um, we've been we've, we have hired a lawyer. In fact, he'll be here tomorrow morning for a tour, but he said that all we really need to do is have some spokesmen involved. Richard has written a letter of opposition, which is a well-written letter. And there's... The opposition in the area here between uh, Portal and Rodeo is almost unanimous. There's, I think there were 107 opposition letters written and uh, obviously some of these people have uh, access to corporate lawyers because <laughs> they are very detailed letters. And then there were four in approval to, because uh, they needed work basically. So it's a situation we plan on beating because there's all kinds of issues, light, dirt, crime. I mean, we're, it's legal in Arizona, but it's not legal federally. So it's a cash business. They can't use banks, which I didn't know. Um, sure. There's water content, uh, pollution, wow. light pollution, odor. I didn't know there was a big odor problem, but they use a lot of fertilizers and things like that. And of course, property values is a concern for all of us in an area where there's not a lot right. of people. So um, I originally was coming on this, segment here to t ask you all to call in tomorrow, but uh, I'm not, I'll get more from the lawyer tomorrow. And if he deems that necessary, I'll run it through Richard's uh, email. Uh, we have support of the Chiricahua Regional Council, which is a big environmental group out here. Um, we have support from the Friends of Cave Creek Canyon. I'm very disappointed in the support from the Dark Sky Association up in Tucson. Um, 
and they like to do things that are not political, I guess. But um, I wanted to make you aware of what's happening out here. Richard, you can add more. I don't think I have anything to add. We'll just keep everyone updated. So I could, I could add a little more. Um, someone I know had this happen next door to them and the out of control situation got extreme and you're only, you're talking a mile away, but the, um, amount of crime in the neighborhood got yeah. really extreme and the amount of gun violence and, uh, how the owners dealt with it with very aggressive dogs. And there were children in the neighborhood. <laughs> I hadn't thought of that one. <laughs> and um, the banking issue is such that because it is a federally uh, illegal substance, um, the place was constantly being broken into. And the yeah. people breaking into it were also dealing with a high level of violence. And um, it took them five years to sell their house at an extreme loss. So what happens in yeah, the environment is have... extreme and it, it, it turned it, it's a really, it was a high end um, upper middle class neighborhood that became gang warfare. Yeah. So well, you don't want they were already informed us that they'll have armed security around the clock and we're going, why do you need armed security if you said crime's not an issue? We're only 30 miles from the Mexican border. The cartels operate just on the other side of the border right. in Douglas. Yeah, it's I mean, really they're not going to let this crap go on up here without the goods paid for it. Most of my neighbors here are armed normally, <laughs> but I'm not. So I have big concerns. One of the things I just saw today, on a, one of the local meteorologists was showing the new national drought monitor. And that area of Arizona is one of the bad drought yeah. areas now. And a pot place like that is going to need a ton of water. So that would yeah. basically this kill the water the, table. Yeah. Well, we already have a problem because of all the pecan and pistachio farms going on out here. And the, if you read the, um, if you read the application, the water was one of the things that stood out. He's got 50 employees and he's going to use 175 gallons of water a day. Well, the sanitary requirements are greater than that, let alone the marijuana plant. Right. And, the guy spilled cannabis four different ways and none of them were correct. So this is a fly by night deal, but it has legal footing. So um, water, water table and usage is one of the factors in our counter arguments. If you guys feel like throwing money at it, I mean, <laughs> lawyers don't work free, but you can contact me privately if you want to do that. And your right, granddaughter, well, your granddaughter named our our owl. So I mean, yes. you know, we've got our owl and we've got our roadrunner. We we got to protect them. That's right. We do. It's called it's called Hoot and Danny. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we will keep everyone updated on this situation. Hopefully, we'll beat it and beat it bad. Um, just a few more things. Uh, you know, I, I I get the occasional email from a member saying. When are we going to meet in person again? Of course, uh, if you go back to what, November, or October, I think, uh, Ellen Comiskey, who we haven't seen since, gave us the epic rant about how she's sick of Zoom. And that was months ago. So I just want to give people an idea of when we might be able to go back to meeting in person again. Um, I'm guessing we're going to be on Zoom until at least through June. So I need to find an alternate speaker for June. Uh, but I am hoping for our July meeting, which is usually gadget night, and it's usually low attended because most members, I guess, don't care about gadgets uh, that members make. Uh, we'll probably hold that in person uh, at the July meeting in the Kalamazoo Nature Center Amphitheater, which is outdoors. So, uh, you know, if we only have the average 20, 30 people show up to, to gadget night, we can easily spread out in the amphitheater and everyone can show their gadgets in person because, you know, gadget night for us is a big tradition that goes back to the 50s and probably last year is the first year in many, many years we did not have gadget night, um, even though most members don't, don't, don't care about it. And as for the picnic in August, I just haven't a clue. Uh, so, so we'll just have to see what things are like by August. Um, but I am hoping that we can uh, begin meeting in Kamsi again in September. 
And again, that's when we'll need someone to record the meetings. But I did want to get some thoughts because we're going to have a board meeting, uh, not tomorrow or, or, or this coming Sunday, but the following Sunday on the 14th of March, not, not May, March, uh, <laughs> is I want, I want to get people's thoughts for resuming uh, public observing sessions at the Kalamazoo Nature Center in April. So how many people like would not go now? And I would. Well, who, who those of you that live in Michigan. <laughs> <laughs> I, I see Jackie raising her hand. I know you're not going to come. That's a hell of a drive. <laughs> I'm, I'm just wondering uh, how many people have had their uh, uh, vaccinations at this point. Ooh, I have. In Ohio, we have. So I think that's sort of a um, an indicator. I I know I would like to, but I mean that's kind of selfish of me because I've had my vaccination and I still plan to wear uh, a mask because I yeah. could still be a transmitter, even though I would be basically protected. We would make that mandatory, of course. You'd you'd have to attend the session and wear a mask. So right. Um, you know, if you want to, I, I did see some hands raised that they weren't going to come, but maybe it's better to, I, I can't do like a polling on Zoom meetings or, a, but, uh, you know, just if anyone wants to share um, why they wouldn't go or why they would go. Of course, we're really anxious to get people to go because we have our new telescope and the observatory, which we really haven't got to share with too many people yet. I, th I think, as far, in my opinion, is we got to be at least, like you said, into June before we think about even really consider having any public kind of uh, yeah. sessions, and maybe later than that. At this point, I'm still planning. The Qantas Club is still planning for a crane fest, but that's in October. Yeah. But uh, that, depending on who you believe. We're either going to be in pretty good shape as far as vaccinations go by June or by uh, beginning of October. So I guess we'll have to see. Even though I'm a retired physician, I'm still trying to keep up with what's happening in that world. And as I listen to people like Dr. Fauci, I think we're talking about the fall as right. the earliest time based on vaccination rates based on what happens with the new variants, uh, a whole bunch of variables that, again, because this is a novel virus, we just don't know. So I'm, I'm all for the conservative, even though I want to get back together. I'm also a member of the Michiana Astronomical Society in South Bend, and you know we're having the same discussion every meeting. And in, in terms of when we're going to have our star party and all of those kinds of things. But I think we're talking about the fall just to be on the safe side. I think conservatively speaking, that's, that's about it. September, maybe by the time kids get ready to go back to school next year, it'll be reasonably safe. That's awesome. Awesome. I'd like to go all the I'm a new member. I've never been to the telescope. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, we have. See. I'm sure we've had people that have been members for close to a year now that never been to Camzy. Of course, that's not too unusual because a lot of the members we never see anyway. But <laughs> well, as well, far as holding the next meetings, so I've read other and seen on TV other entomologists, other experts that say it's quite likely even the beginning of summer or even before that we might have herd immunity just because natural. A lot of people have had coronavirus. I mean the coronavirus and are immune to some period after that. And just uh, other people are naturally immune. So I don't think it's, I know being conservative is one thing, but I'm around people all the time, I go shopping. I don't uh, order everything in. And I'm vaccinated, thank God, but I'm still cautious. I wear you know, a mask right. on of respect for everybody else. But I think there's a little bit, a little bit too much fear. That's my personal opinion. Yeah. It's just a attending a meeting, a live meeting is a voluntary. You're not forcing anybody to do anything. Hey, Richard. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Volunteers that would show up for your first meeting. It might be only 20 people. They can spread out in the room. No problem. Yeah. Well, yeah. Selfishly, like I said, I would, I would come and wear a mask. I mean, yeah, but that's just me. 
Hell, you can go to a pro sports game. Well, we will uh, talk about it at the board meeting. I, I do want to invite everyone to attend the board meeting. Again, it's on March 14th. Oh, I got a typo on the agenda. It's at 5 o'clock, not 7 o'clock. So I just noticed that typo there. I'll come back to that later. Uh, I so, figured because we went to fake time that day, you moved yeah, the time. Yeah. Well, I, I don't spend a lot of time on agendas these days. So uh, one last item for the president's report on a personal uh, uh, item is I'm going to try again um, to do another introduction to astronomy class. This is my 11-week uh, course. It is basically the same exact class that I taught at KVCC, <laughs> Western Albion College, um, uh, Glen Oaks Community College. So uh, that'll probably start April 6th. Um, I'll have a link on the, the KS website here probably tonight or tomorrow, but you can download the uh, syllabus through the website. Amongst the, uh, you know, the, the, the little slideshow on the website, it'll be the last slide, but it, it won't be there for a few hours. So, um, again, there, there is a fee. It, it's $150 for this 11-week course. That works out to like uh, $6.82 a lecture, which I think is a bargain. Uh, so, if you've ever wanted to take an astronomy class or, uh, uh, you know, do some catch-up learning, this is a great thing to do. I didn't really plan on doing another one so soon or really at all, uh, but many people on the uh, amateur astronomy series I'm doing have met, have asked for it. So I figured, why not? You know, money's money. I might as well try to do it again. So um, we are more than halfway to my preferred minimum. So um, if we do pick up a few more members here and some people from the lecture series, and maybe I'll try to send out something to all the clubs again. We will probably pull it off. So um, you can just email me if you want more information, and I can send you the syllabus if you forget to go to the website. So uh, I just wanted to mention that. Uh, moving on to observing reports here. I just want to mention something real quick. When does that class start? April 6th. Thank you. And it's twice a week, Tuesdays and Thursdays. So for observing reports, I... Um, Mentioned I can't walk very well right now because my foot's messing up, but I did kind of hobble in the backyard a couple nights ago with my uh, new Orion binoculars here, and I did look at uh, the Mars near the Pleiades, so that was fun. They're probably still in the same field of view of at least 7 by 50 binoculars, so we do have clear sky. So after the meeting, run out and check out uh, the Mars and the Pleiades. Anybody else have any observing? I observed Alan Dyer got a great shot of Mars and the Pleiades, so, you know, we I could hate on him. I saw that. Did anybody see a Pulfus come by this evening? There it goes right now. Well, okay. No, <laughs> well, somebody might have been watching a TV of it or on the other computer or whatever. <laughs> no, I've been um, imaging all, all week pretty much. I almost got 30 hours of data so far for this week alone. Wow. So, cool. and amazing for uh, Michigan in March. Yeah, it is. Don't you mean May? No, <laughs> <laughs> got a few more days, Pete. It's not going to, it won't cloud up until Monday. Yeah. No, there's no yep. such thing as Monday. Yep. I might try to hobble out to the observatory uh, tomorrow. I'm, I'm, I'm curious to see if they still have the porta potties blocking the, the dirt road there. It's going to be clear out here tonight. Yeah. You know, those porta potties are portable potties, so we can move them if they are. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think they'd appreciate that very much. <laughs> well, we just put them back when we leave. Any other observing? Richard, I mentioned uh, I've been doing um, double stars, and since yeah. I'm right up in there, managed to get uh, probably another six or seven double stars, and I observed uh, a trapezium. Um, but I was able to observe uh, the two additional stars other than the four. I didn't see the sixth that you can, or the seventh you can sometimes see. Um, and I and I hate to say it, but uh, Sirius A is not a very far hop from there, and uh, Sirius B is definitely visible in a ten-inch telescope. What? Oh, Richard doesn't like hearing that. So, oh. <laughs> maybe you're trying too hard. Maybe I'm trying too hard. <laughs> but it's there. Well, I might have to hobble out there and tr try it again. Maybe it's just it's so really bright. Excited, through a I mean, you guys made it such a big thing. I was like, oh, but I wouldn't have even known it. If you didn't know to look for it, it like it's so it blinks in and out and it gets blinded out so easy. But uh, 
As soon as you guys said it was there, and I knew to look for it, yeah, it was there. If I get Lady. desperate, I'll I'll set up my five inch stellar view. If you can't see it in that, you can't see it in anything. <laughs> oh man, the count begins at one. Hey, hey, Rich. Yeah. Can I uh, share my screen to show you what uh, my? Oh sure, screen? sure. Okay, hold on. Where is? I got I got I got to change this to observing slash imaging reports. Nice. I know. This is uh, M81 up in. This is just the luminance data so far. But earlier in the week, we've had exceptional seeing for, for around here. The seeing, I got dipped below two arc seconds seeing. I don't know if can you can see that. You bastard. So a lot of nice crisp detail. You got the little uh, satellite galaxy over here on the left side. Um, yeah, tons of background. Whoop, whoop. Ah, my eyes. Oh, there you go. I like that. Whoop. As Mike Sinclair would say, we hate you. There you go. We hate you. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Hey, Pete, why are you getting double diffraction on the bright stars? You're getting, if you take those up to 100%, you got four diffra eight diffraction spikes. Only on Just these. one. Well, yeah, it's, whoop, whoop, whoop. Uh, hold on, I'm going to make you guys puke. <laughs> <laughs> it's just too close. It's just too close stars. These are 10 minute. Oh, yeah. yeah. They're wow. 10 minute su subs, 10 minute um, exposures I'm using. So that's so. a stacking issue? No, no, it's just. It's right. a close double. Yeah, it's a hey, close double. Aaron, there's a oh. good target. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, it doesn't look like one I'll be able to split. <laughs> <laughs> well, you just did. Gas him send you the picture. Yep. There. <laughs> and I also got the uh, IFN nebula in here, too, for, for those that know the whole northern it, part of the sky is this. The integrated nebula. flux nebula. That's what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. Pretty cool. Never thought I'd see it from here. But the dimmest galaxy is like around 20th right now. That's what I found. I don't even know. It's some like PK something, 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 something. So. Did you get your 1100 mount yet? No. They, I, ha I ended up, uh, the price increase got passed on to me, so I had to cough up another $1,700. Oh, oh, that's bull. Yeah, a AP decided to raise the price like a week before they started notifying people. So, yeah, that stinks. You hear that, Dave Wolf? Your your amount has increased in value. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, moving on. Astronomical news and uh, events. We we have a new rover on Mars. Yay! Hey. So we have uh, Curiosity and Perseverance now, and apparently uh, Perseverance. Uh, moved. It, it, it performed its first uh, roving rover, Rovington thing. <laughs> a test drive. A little, a little test drive, yes. How, how many of us have our name engraved on the chip uh, on Perseverance? Me. Mine's the biggest, of course. You can see my name bearing anybody else's. Yes, yeah, clear as a bell. <laughs> I hope it doesn't drive into one of those lava tubes. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah but the, gravi the gravity's out. low enough they could maybe jump over it if it, they get it go going fast enough, you know. Are, are you daring them to try? Oh, no. I'd hear about that if I did. Uh, uh, Ray Bradbury once wrote a short story about a Martian couple where he was angry with all the probes that were coming from Earth and would go out and smash them at whenever one would land nearby. Any other but, uh, astronomical news and events anybody wanted to share? There's an asteroid supposed to go by tomorrow that's uh, real close. That's Apophis, I think, Apophis, yeah. yeah. Right. Before it slams oh, tomorrow, into us. Okay. Does it might be as much of a magnitude three if you go out and look at the right time. It's supposed to be live stream too. Hmm. All right. Any more? Any more news before we move on here? I'm trying to rush through the agenda here. Of course, we can hang out uh, a bit afterwards. So, any it's more news? Night, so let's get this wrapped up. Yeah, let's get this wrapped up. We got we got clear skies. Okay, so we'll move on from news. There, we'll make it easy on Aaron writing up the minutes. Uh, let me give a quick uh, preview of the event horizon we got coming up. Of course, uh, tomorrow. 
at 1 p.m. Eastern. We have part four of the Introduction to Amateur Astronomy lecture series. So I'll be talking about uh, telescopes, uh, telescope mounts, accessories, all that good stuff. So, so, I'm, so I'm sure uh, part four is the one many people have been waiting for. And uh, hopefully we'll have another big crowd. We've been around uh, 400 for, I think, all of them. Maybe we were almost at 500 for the first one. Then the next two have been around 400 each. So we've had great crowds. And again, people all over the world have attended. So it's been just fantastic. Just too bad you can't see anybody. Um, then uh, next Saturday, we have the Messier Marathon. That'll be at Richland Township Park. If you don't know Richland Township Park, the place is huge. There's again even though we're at record membership the entire membership could show up and easily be six feet apart so that's how big richland township park is so you you have no worries about being too close to anyone if you want to come out and do the marathon and you know have safety in numbers or something like that so if it is clear we'll have people there the great thing about richland is there's no gate to worry about so you you, you, you can come as early or, or hopefully not too late because, uh, you know, car lights and that sort of thing. You can leave whenever you want. You don't have to worry about the, the, the gate at all. Just one big down thing. There's no place to pee. So if we do have a big crowd, which we, we won't, we hardly ever have more than 20, 25 people come to the marathon. Uh, you'll have to wander off and find a friendly bush to relieve yourself on or something like that. Um, I know you're getting a fun, fun picture in your head right now. So, um, of course, uh, most people don't do the marathon, that they don't take it seriously. So, but if you are there to specifically do the marathon, we'll try to leave you alone, especially when you're going through the Virgo cluster, because that's, that's the harrowing part of the, the marathon. And um, hopefully we'll have clear skies, but the weather forecast does not look promising, but it could change. Again, we got a board meeting, our, our first since January. It's on March 14th at five o'clock. Uh, members are welcome to attend, but you'll have to email me to get the uh, Zoom info. We don't send that out to uh, anybody, usually just board members. And again, we have uh, the conclusion, part five of the Intro to Amateur Astronomy Lecture Series. That one is on astrophotography. So, uh, Pete, you better take that one. You haven't a clue what you're doing, man. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> I got I got a film camera. Can I use that? Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Uh, next item, prime focus. As usual, the deadline is the 15th of every month. Hopefully, uh, Mr. Mumbauer there will uh, wrap up the member observatory series because I have run out of members with observatories or at least that are willing to share a article. I, I know there are other members out there with observatories, but but I've emailed them and never heard a thing. So uh, I, I, I think Pete will be the exciting conclusion. I don't know about exciting, but I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll show you. I'll tell my tale. Okay. Well, that's where a good editor comes into play. You've got to pump it up a little bit. Ooh, so I just got to give you one sentence and you'll finish. That's it. right. That's right. I'll, 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 I'll embellish. Uh, other items. Any, anyone else want to share anything else? off the agenda any astronomical topics jack um did you see the video decommissioned that i recommended to you i did not look at it no i i did not do a search for it i haven't had time okay i would recommend to people that just for the heck of it it's a short six minute video it's called decommissioned if you do a google search for it you can find it it has to do with the um russian space suit some years ago that they put an amateur radio in it and tossed it overboard to get rid of it and uh, there's a, it's a sci-fi video of sorts. It's about six minutes, but it's worth looking for. Again, it's called Decommissioned. If you do a, do a Google search for a video called that, you'll find it. And uh, it's on YouTube and a couple other places. All righty. I have uh, one other thing. Dr. Levesque, who gave the lecture in December, mm -hmm. just uh, came out with a great courses course called Heroes of uh, Heroes, Heroes and Discoveries of Astronomy. So, if you're familiar with the great courses, that's those are college level lecture courses as well. And it, as I've started uh, listening to it, it kind of parallels her book to a certain extent. She particularly talks about the role of women in astronomy in the first 
couple of lectures and it's it's really quite good. She's a good lecturer as you found out in December um, and storyteller. So I'd recommend that. Could you repeat there her name? Uh, Emily Levesque, L-E-V-E-S-Q-U-E, PhD. Yeah, thank you. Yep. Any any other things anybody wanted to mention? Do our clocks jump ahead tomorrow? No. Next Sunday. No, that's next Sunday, thank goodness. Next. Okay, thank you. I knew it was coming up. It's a week later this year, it seems. Second Sunday of March. We'll have to make sure we send out a reminder to uh, board members because I, I recall uh, last year, Aaron showed up about an hour late. <laughs> you know <laughs> we'll call you. All right. Uh, here, nothing else. We'll uh, give a preview for next month. I, I was hoping to have him in person. That's why he's uh, somewhat in the area. Uh, we, we tried this last year, but that's when things went to hell in a handbasket. So we kind of had to cancel. I, did not even know what Zoom was back then. Oh, those were the days. Uh, so we have uh, Dr. Timothy Beers from the University of Notre Dame. He last visited us in person back in 2005, I think. I'll, I'll look that up for sure before next month. And he'll be presenting, putting together the pieces of the Milky Way, now with pictures. And so based on his last presentation, uh, this should be a good one as well. Hopefully we'll have another huge crowd. And I hope you can join us. So without uh, nothing else, we'll go ahead and officially adjourn the meeting. And uh, we'll see you all hopefully tomorrow. So join us.